Welcome, everybody. We're glad to see you tonight, and uh, happy to have you with us here at Faith and Victory Church for our midweek Bible study. We're continuing to teach on your, to your words, your tongue, and your future, and uh, last week we finished up and um, with um, Jesus being the high priest of our confession, and so now we want to start talking, we want to share and talk about how can our words change things? You know, how do our words change things? And so we can say this, our Words change things. Now I'm going to do a little denim right here because they create things. Okay? They modify things. Okay? So our words... So, in the negative, they can, um, they can modify it to, to bad. They can change it for good, for negative to positive. They can actually create something that's not there. All right? And uh, so, we, we, let's run real quick over to uh, a, a, a Corinthians. Grab, grab the book of Corinthians. I think 2 Corinthians. That's why I'm... Hi, Penny. Good to see you. Ah, it's not there. Where are you, where are you going, son? It's not in my notes. That's why when I when I just wrote that up there, it just kind of oh yeah, I need to say that. Okay, Second Corinthians, chapter four and eighteen. It says. Uh, while we look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are the things which are not seen. I'm sorry. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are, are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. And so, I know we taught this before, but when we, we look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, and we get to uh, temporal. We can really say that that mean, it means, and it kind of translates out um, loosely as subject to change. Now, notice he says, for the things which are seen. What are, what's seen? <laughs> Circumstances. Situation. Okay. Uh, yeah, what was, was just what that? What you whatever you can see. So what is seen? Circumstance, your situation, you know, uh, things in your body, you know, all that kind of stuff. That he says. So while we look not, notice he said not at the things which are seen. Why? Because the thing, the things which are seen are what? They're temporal. They're subject to change. They're changeable. In other words, these things are not. These are not eternal. These are non-eternal things. They're not eternal. They are not going to be like that until Jesus, I mean, until uh, three million uh, years until the millennia. A little bit past the, the, the millennia. Until eternity. You know, when we all go to heaven, uh, these circumstances, situations are not eternal. They are not going to last. The things which are seen are temporal. They're subject to change. And so Paul writes to the church at Corinth in the, set, in the uh, fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians and says, while we look not at the things which are seen, for the same things which are, I'm sorry, not seen, I keep doing that, for things which are not seen, for the things which are not seen are what? The things that's not seen are eternal, but the things which are seen are temporal. They are temporal. The things which you look at, when you look at your circumstances, when you look at your situation, when you feel the pain in your body, we'll just write pain up here, okay? When you look at all these things, when you're dealing with all these things, these things are temporal. They are subject to change, okay? They don't have the final say, amen? They do not, they 
do not have final say. The things which are temporal do not have final say. They don't get the last word. Amen? They don't get to determine the outcome unless you let them. Amen? Okay. And so he says, so he says, uh, while we look not at the things which are seen, so don't look at the temple because they're subject to change. They don't have the final say. They're not eternal. Um, they're the circumstances, the situations, the pains, the, the, these different things. The doctor's report. You know, remember in, in Isaiah 52, there starting around verse 13, it says, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord extended? Amen. We have we sing that song. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. See, you can get reports that are circumstances, that are situations, that are pain, that are whatever the doctor says, but those things are still eternal. They do not get the final say. Who gets final say? You do. Well, I thought God had the final say. No, God has given you the other side of the equation. Remember, Paul says here now, he says, while we look not at the things which are seen, because the th seen things are eternal, okay, the seen is eternal, he says, but at the things which are, what? Not seen. For the things which are not seen are eternal. Well, what besides God himself is eternal? His word. Because he says, Forever, forever, thy word is settled in heaven. And I believe it actually says, O oh Lord. Okay? Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Settled. Okay? So God has already made the statement, all right, that there is something. So, so here we are, we're, we're, in the, we're on the balance of things. We have the seen, which can be changed. We have the unseen, or the not seen, which is eternal. It never changes. So how do we enforce this or this in the, in the uh, things of our life that affect us in our life? Right. Now, we can and we can enforce this with what our words our words honestly can set this and establish this what's proverbs say death and life are in the power of the tongue i don't have that in my notes so somebody look that up real quick we can it's proverbs 18 or something i'm not sure right off where it is okay Proverbs, and y'all find that, I'll put the scripture reference up there. Death and life, and then it's going to kind of power, where's the power of those things at? In the tongue. Okay, 1820. I thought it was 18. Okay. 1821. All right. Look at this. Well, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So if death is in the power of the tongue, what's that? That's going to be your seen stuff. The circumstances that are against you. Okay? But he also comes back and says that what? Life is in the power of the tongue. Well, if we've got Death is in the power of the tongue, and life is in the power of the tongue. Then wh who establishes which one is working in our life? We do. Because of our tongue. All right? Well, God, it happens because of God, that's what God wants. No, no, no. He said that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, we kind of want to go positive with that, they that love it. In other words, whatever's in your heart the most, whatever you adhere to in your heart, you're going to eat the fruit of that. Okay? You will eat the fruit of your tongue. 
And then, you know, do you want the sin which you already got that you don't like? Or do you want the eternal? Okay? Those choices become, be, become important because um, these are the things that you have to understand because if we, don't under, if we don't get a revelation that the scene, the temple, is subject to change and that God's word changes not, you know, and, and a lot of times we're kind of sitting around and we're wanting God to fix it all and God to do it all and God to take care of it all and God's got a plan and he's going to work it out no matter what and we're in the grace, it just doesn't matter what I do, it's going to happen. <laughs> that was a flying raspberry. All right? Honestly. God's not, you're not a puppet. You're not sitting on the stage of the world with God, you got you on strength, and He's just making, you, making all this stuff happen whether you like it or not. Because He said that these things are in the power of your tongue, of the tongue, of your tongue. It's, it's going to be you. Now, we've talked about the importance, you know, your words, your tongue, your future. Um, you know, uh, the power of the Word of God. The Word of God has power. Okay? All right? You know, so the things which are seen are, are, are um, temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. God's Word is eternal. <clears throat> and when you bring eternity by the authority given unto you through, through the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, as a child of God, born of God, in my name you shall. Okay? When you bring eternity by authority into contact with earthly, eternity rules. I said eternity rules. The spiritual will supersede the natural. Remember that words, they are spirit and they are life, Jesus said. Okay? And so the spiritual power of the Word of God will supersede the natural circumstances of life. Much like, you know, um, Romans, the eighth chapter, tells us that the law of the Spirit and life in Christ, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus overcomes the law of sin and death. Okay? John G. Lake. And when he was in England, not in England, when he was, went to Africa because of the outbreak of the bubonic plague, and he went there, and he was, he was actually a medical doctor. And um, he was there working with the, uh, the sick and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And um, No, why are you repeating? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm over here just preaching away and forgot to tell everybody on Facebook we're here. They missed, it. They missed probably the best 10 minutes of their life. Amen. What I just said in the first 10 minutes of this, you know, will, will revolutionize your life, will change your life, will make things different. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Let's see here. Faith and victory church. We're live. We're alive. Yeah, and we are live. What I just said in the first 10 minutes of this, you know. I'm going to tell you something. There are moments in my days, I think, to have a computer programming degree and to be this challenged just isn't right. <laughs> That's just not right. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, me. That's right. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. One of the funniest things was when we, went, we did go to Smithsonian, and we walked by, and there was a compact luggable, which was the first notebook, basically. It was a portable computer, and it weighed 70 pounds. You know, you, it was a CPU case. When you lay it down, you press in, and the keyboard fell off, and there was a little five-inch screen on there with two floppy drives. <laughs> <coughs> you could lug luggable. You could lug at home. <laughs> it was portable computing. You could take it home and work. And it was a... Uh, and we went back, and it was at the Smithsonian. <laughs> Janie used to bring one home from work. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Anyway, so if you guys weren't here at the beginning because I didn't share it, you go back and listen to the rest of it because what I shared already will absolutely change your life. All right. Praise the Lord. And so where was it before I got off and all that? Anybody remember? 
just going back and playing it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So, you know, um, uh, what was, yes, the super, John G. Lake, he, he, you know, he, was, he was in Africa dealing with, the, they were burying the dead and that kind of stuff. And in the English sent a, uh, sent a medical frigate there. They came up, the, they got, got up as far as they could go in the river and came in. And he's there handling the bodies and all this kind of stuff. And they say, that, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. He said, well, they're highly contagious. Highly contagious. Even after death, they're highly contagious. And he, he said, guys, have you got a microscope? And so they, he took the microscope. And he said, yeah, they set it up. He said, look, give me, give me one of your, um, your um, slides there. And he reached over to one of the dead. When they died, this, this foam would just come up out of their lungs and just come out of their mouth. It was just it was a horrible death. And he took his hand, and they, I mean, actually he took it and didn't put it on, he didn't touch it, wiped it up, and said, now look at that. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's bubonic plague. He said, okay. Then he took his hand, wiped, wiped it on the slide, and said, look at that. They said, it's dying right before our eyes. And he looked at him and said, sirs, that is the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, overcoming the law of sin and death. In other words, it couldn't touch him because of the spiritual law that was at work in him, the circumstances and situations of life, you couldn't overcome him. Amen? He had power and authority over those things. Glory to God. And you do too because that law is at work in you. Amen? How, so how do we enforce it? How do we put it into operation? If it's there, how do we put it into operation? The tongue. You put it into operation by the power of of your words and I tell people this <coughs> and I've had to practice it myself in life if you can't speak faith shut up until you can I mean sometimes you how many have ever been where you just wanted to say the wrong thing it was like something was driving you to say the wrong thing bite your tongue till it bleeds you can get healed later all right? Don't let that loose because you're releasing the power either to establish the scene or to establish the unseen. So, as we were saying with the lake story, what happens when the, when, when the unseen comes in contact with the scene? It's coming, the eternal comes into contact with temporal subject to change. Meaning what? This can't change. His word cannot change. Proverbs 18, 21 is forever settled. It can't change. So what happens when that which cannot change comes in contact to that which is subject to change? That was a question. It has to change. There's no choice. That which is subject to change must change when it, is, it comes in contact with that which cannot change. It's just, it's just the, it's the, it's the final product. It's like a steamroller. You know, you might be standing up when the steamroller comes, you change. You're not going to stop this. You're not going to change the steamroller. Okay? You'll be flat. Okay? You'll be laying on the interstate. All right? Maybe not looking that good either. <laughs> okay, so if, if we have this circumstance, this, this thing where the power of life and death is in the tongue, that Paul tells us that we don't look at the things which are seen, uh, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal, that means now that we have something, of, and, and as a Christian, as a Christian, what does God say? He watches over his word to perform it amen all right jesus is the high priest of our profession or confession not only is his word forever settled he stands behind it to make sure it comes to pass look at isaiah 55 do not think i'm going to get to any scriptures i have in my notes and, oh well, Isaiah 55, okay, 
Okay, so we're, we'll come over here. We're going to establish this some more. Isaiah 55. We'll pick up here in, um, we'll back up here to verse 8. And the Lord says this, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Now, let, let me say something. You know, we'll start in verse 8. This doesn't mean you can't, they can't become your ways. But he's saying, in the natural, unrenewed mind, without you making adjustments in life, your thoughts are not his thoughts. It's, it's kind of, the, you know, the, the, the structure of it, is kind of, it kind of goes like this. The way you think is not the way I think. Okay? The way I talk is not the way you talk. And until, and it's, it will not be with your natural mind. But Paul wrote to the church and said, but you had the mind of Christ. Remember that? His ways are past finding out. You know, I have not seen, ear hath not heard. Over in Romans. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither is into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. Okay? And then he goes on and says this, but we have the mind of Christ. The, un, the, the, the unrenewed mind, the natural mind, doesn't think the way God thinks. It thinks carnal. The unrenewed mind, the natural mind, doesn't allow you to talk the way God talks. It talks carnal. Okay? And so, but when we are born again, and then we go to the Word of God, and we feed on the Word of God, and we study on the Word of God, and we put on the mind of Christ, then what happens? We can know His ways. It changes things. What did Romans 12 say? I'll, I'll come back to Isaiah. What did Romans 12 say? One and two. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. King James for spiritual. I don't know why King Jimmy thinks reasonable means spiritual, but they, that's the word they use. And, uh, and you, you got to understand, languages change. Words Words morph. They change in, in intent and meaning in, uh, based on era, culture, all that kind of stuff. So reasonable back in, in, in 1611 could have meant spiritual with the King Jimmy crowd. Okay? Anyway, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove was that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we get into verse 2 there, and I'm not, I'm not done with Isaiah 55. don't think I've left it, okay? And we know this. He says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right? And we, we've said this numerous times. And we'll just, it's, it's a good teaching, and you need to be reminded of it. The word transform comes from what? The Greek word metamorpho. That's an R. Okay, that's the Greek. Okay. And it doesn't take a whole lot of rocket science to sit in the room together to figure out this. Metamorpho metamorphosis. Okay. I may have spelled that wrong. Okay, metamorphosis. What does metamorphosis mean? To change from one state to another. Okay, you change from one state to another. Tadpole becomes a bullfrog. Caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It's a complete change in everything about you. Okay? So Paul writes and says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. What? Don't keep being, you know, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, for they, you know, they're higher. Okay? I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither is any into the heart of man. The, thing, the things that God, I didn't write that down, did I? Okay, the things that God's prepared for them that love him. But we have the mind of Christ. Be not conformed to the world. Don't stay where his ways are not your ways and his thoughts are not your thoughts. But be transformed. Have a metamorphosis. Let your mind experience changing from one state to another, from the carnal mind to the spiritual mind. Because when you go from the carnal mind to the spiritual mind, okay, what 
what happens? Now, the carnal mind doesn't have the ways of God. The carnal mind doesn't think like God. But the, the metamorphosis, by the renewing of your mind, feeding on the Word of God, through the washing of the water of the Word. Receive, James says in James 1, he says, receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your soul. And we talked about this numerous times. You know, to sozo your suke, engrafted. It's kind of like the Borg if you're Star Trek. Okay? It, we, we will assimilate you. We will add your distinctive, uh, biological distinctiveness to our collective. The Word of God um, comes in and it engrafts itself in your soul, in your mind. It rewires it. I said it rewires it. Now, um, I, I not that long ago, um, the blower on my Jeep, my, my old Jeep, the one that Nathan blew the engine that I put another back engine back in, I still have, I have now, I love it, love that Jeep. And, um, but I, the blower motor um, messed something messed up, it wouldn't turn off. Even when you turn the car off, the resistor went out. And it messed up the motor and everything. So you turn the car off, you have to get out, open the hood, get out, put on your nose, and pull the, and pull the um, fuse to turn the blower motor off. It'd run and kill the battery all night. It just wouldn't take it long to kill the battery. So I took it and got some work done on it, got it back, and you, that motor was just blowing like crazy. And you, you couldn't hardly even feel the air coming out of the vents. That was, that was, that was late last year. And, um, I mean, it was just like you ride, you'd be riding. It's hot as all get out. You got the motor, and you hear it going, and you put your hand down, you, you can barely feel a little, a little cold air seeping out. No. That's what I thought. I thought it was something that got in there and stopped it up and talked to one mechanic. He said maybe a squirrel got in there and built a nest, got in there while it sat, you know, and built a nest in there with, you know, something and blocked it up. So um, I took it to the dealership. I was going to I'm, I'm get this AC fixed once and for all. I'm, they got to take the whole dash out again and replace everything. I want it right. And we, we hadn't done it yet. I'm waiting on some of those things to get, get to it because it's not cheap. Um, it's $945 to take the dash out. That's not any parts. That's just that's just the labor on the taking the dash out and putting it back in. That's what I said. Because <laughs> the whole thing has to come out anyway. And so I, I, I go back to pick it up after they did the diagnostic on it. The guy was telling me what it's going to cost to fix everything. You know, do everything on the dash, all the the, the motors, the the damper, everything. Get it all right. Fix it. I don't want to take this dash out again. I want it right. Okay. And. Um, I said, you yeah, know, that motor just blows. He said, oh, yeah. He said, I don't know why they do it. He said, but when you get these motors now, because this is the vehicle seven, you know, 17 years old, the, the way they're manufactured now is the, the wires are backwards. So the motor's turning the wrong way. Yeah, he, it's, he, said, he, said, it's, it, he said the harness that they do, whatever they, whoever's manufacturing these things post-market, they got it wired backwards. Yeah. And so he said, I just switched two wires. I mean, it's yeah, all right. <clears throat> switched two wires and it's running right. It got rewired. You see? And as we get our mind rewired with the Word of God, it starts functioning properly. See, it's, 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 it's just going to it the before, but it's not doing what it's supposed to do. That motor, I mean, you could hear it. But it was sucking air instead of blowing air. Because, you know, the, the little fins and stuff, they weren't, they weren't catching the air. They were actually resisting the air. And, like, it just needed to be rewired. And then it really produced good. And, you see, your mind is not, it, 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 it's, it, it works. But until you rewire it, it won't produce the desired results which in my case was cold air that I could feel, you know? Um, and because my damper motor, the damper's tore up, which is going to be one of the things that gets replaced when I take the dash out, um, it's, it's set to open. So if I got out and got 55, 60 miles an hour, I could feel a little bit more air as the air was coming in a little bit through the, through the opening. Yeah, except the other thing was sucking it away. <laughs> but I still felt more, you know? Your mind is to be rewired. 
It is to have the transformation. You're to renew it with the Word of God. Let the metamorphosis, the rewiring of how you think take place. And when that happens, the saving of your soul, the, um, the sozo of your suke, suke is the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotions, the saving of it, the restoration, the making whole, the making sound. Now remember, sozo can mean saved, born again, but it also means to restore, to make sound, to make whole. So in, in context with the suke, your, 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 your suke doesn't get born again. It gets restored and made sound. What did the psalmist say? He restoreth my soul. See, that's not, that's why I'm getting saved. No. The spirit of man doesn't get restored. He gets born again. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. You see, you become a new creature in Christ. And all things are of God. So you, when you get born again, you don't, your spirit does not get restored. It gets born again. It becomes born anew. It becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. But your head needs a checkup from the neck up. All right? It needs, it needs to be rewired. It needs to be reprogrammed. It needs to be able to think the way God desires for you to think. Because when you think like he thinks, when you walk like he walks, when your ways are like his ways, then you begin that when you encounter these things we call temporal, and you don't like what you're seeing, you go back and say, well, but I don't think like that. So what does the not seen eternal have to say about it? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to weigh the two on the balance of the scales of life. Okay? I'm going to, I'm going to get me a... You know? I am not drawing a good scale. I was trying to draw a scale. I was trying to draw. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate the, uh, you know... Okay? We got these little... Got these little... little you know this is the pedestal this is the floor okay got this little fancy knobby thing up here yeah. it's like mickey mouse deformed okay so we've, we've got these we've got these scales well what happens when scales when you put more on one side than the other and you see when you come into life and you're and uh, many times what happens is we start out, okay, we don't start out balanced. We start out with, you know, uh, this way down here, seen. And then we, we come back over here and we got the unseen up here. The only way to change that, because this is, listen, most of the time in life, this is where you, you will start here. And you're going to have to drop enough word onto this to change that scale. This the only, to, to bring, and then, yeah, this, unless you get a super dose of, of, of a word all of a sudden and, and, and just drop it on it, 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 it normally goes, okay, I put one, I put more on it. You, you've seen it. <laughs> you take out the two grams, the one gram, the half a gram, the quarter gram, and you start putting them on. Now, what we're trying to do usually in, in weighing stuff is to get them to balance. But in life, we don't want it to balance. We want it. We want the, the unseen to outweigh, to take press. <laughs> so you got to keep adding the word to it, keep adding the word to it, keep adding the word to it. And as you do, it starts coming up. And then what you want to do is you want to reverse this whole thing to where the uns to the scene no longer has any weight on your life. What has weight on your life? What has bearing on your life? And and I'm not going to redraw this, guys. Okay, I said we'll reverse this. All right. So after enough time of putting the word in there.
the unseen now bears weight on our life. It takes the precedent. It takes the authority. It takes the position that this now controls how we act, what we think, what we say, what we do. Over this. This is just... You know, as try, as, try as it may, it can't force this back up. How would it force it back up? You take something off. What would that be? You start saying this and putting that on that side. And then, then the balance would change back. But as long as you keep putting the word on it, keep putting the word on it. Now, you've lifted this up so it no longer has weight on you, life. No longer has bearing on you. It's no longer the force that determines whether or not you're able to do what God wants you to do, or what you want to do, or have what you want to have. Live the way that God wants you to live. Amen. I mean, I've said this before. We, you know, um, dealing with race, race relations in our country, dealing with, you know, um, the after effects. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we think now, it's been so many years since, you know, the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation and all that stuff and all the, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. And, um, and then even, even since the mid-50s and 60s, the junk that was still going on in our country. Okay? Now, it's been, you know, that was 100 years after, um, you know, the Civil War, you know, maybe 80 years after Reconstruction. Um, when did Reconstruction end? Okay, so by 1976, 1977, Reconstruction been 100 years old. And I, look, we had, there was junk going on. Uh, we had, somebody used to go to our church, and he told me, he, he was a college kid, he was from Mississippi. Him and three friends were riding down the road, and, and a truck uh, pulled up, uh, honky-tonk, rednecks, and they put our shotgun and shot the window out of their car. What that does uh, not bode well for good race relations. Okay? Yeah, there's hatred. People have hatred. They have anger. They have, you know, but what is it? That's a devil. Okay? But I, I'm telling you, if we continue to allow the narrative of that to control where people go today, then these, these scales in that situation is going to be out of balance. There's evil stuff. Okay? We as the church have to do the work. And, if, and I'm talking about not the white church, the black church, the Asian church, the Latino church. I'm talking about the church. We've got to walk in love. We talked about that. We've got to walk in love. We've got to walk in forgiveness. We've got to walk in understanding. And we can't let things that, that the devil tries to bring put the weight on the wrong side. Why? Because it will begin to bear weight on your life. Amen. Amen. Was the things that happened in our country evil? Of course they were. Anybody owning anyone that, or thinking they had the right to is evil. Israel was in slavery for 400 years. Okay? There, there been, there, we, have, we have slavery today. There's human trafficking going on today. I don't know if you know this or not, but Charlotte, North Carolina is the number one place in America for, the, for sex trafficking of, of uh, kidnapped girls. Charlotte. And the reason we know... <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Jeff's always able to bring out another side to it that gives us a, a visual. Um, <clears throat> we, we knew a, a, somebody that worked with one of our senators. and We were, we were in D.C. and then we called him and we had lunch with him at the, in the Senate Cafe. It was pretty cool. Um, but they, they shared it with us. Now, that's not something they just don't publish that everywhere. But, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out what to do because Charlotte has become the number one place for sex trafficking. What do you mean? They kidnap them. You see these girls going missing and stuff. You hear about these girls? They're being kidnapped and then brought and sold to rich people somewhere who come in here and, buy, and, and, and they, they get them out of the country and they become their sex slave at 12 and 13 years old. When I went to Thailand, um, it was horrible. And, and they said the Germans would come to Thailand, go to a village, and choose a girl. And the, and the, and the king of the little village would go over there to uh, the parents, take the daughter from them, and say, you can have another child, but he's going to give us to feed our whole village for a year. And, give, and sell the daughter into sex slavery to this person. And, and, by, and, and you know, it's evil. 
I said it's evil. Slavery because of race. Slavery before sex. Slavery for any reason. Slavery because you're, you're the opposite tribe. I mean, Africa, Africa's, you know, well, they, they, they weren't Europeans in Africa. They were tribal wars. And they put each other into slavery. The Congos and the Zulus and all this kind of stuff or kill each other off. It's evil. There's no other word for it. Okay? We just, we just, we settle that. However, where we are now, we have got to put eternity on even those things. We had, you know, one thing is, we had to forget the past. Now, when I say forget the past, I don't mean to doom to repeat history. We, we can't just keep bringing up that, you know, some people had slaves back in the, the 12th, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and, you know, somebody's got to pay for it today. It can't be done. I said it can't be done. And the only way you could do something like that, you would destroy the country so nobody wanted to live in it when you got done. It can't be done. Now, there has been, and, and I'm going to say something, because people keep using that as an excuse, and I'm, and don't, don't, don't get upset with me, but as the reason why they're not getting ahead, they're letting the scene take weight. But I promise you, I don't care what gender, I mean, not gender, you know, what gender, it doesn't matter what gender you were born, male or female, no one can keep you down you live the word you don't have to change genders you can't do that anyway you can mutilate or something but you can't actually change it doesn't matter your chrome you don't change your chromosomes because you have an operation okay it doesn't happen you can't do it can't change the chromosomes it's you are what you are now i'm sure some scientists in some laboratory somewhere is trying to figure out how to change chromosomes but they're, they're, they're playing with stuff that just they ain't supposed to be playing with. I'm sure they are. <clears throat> or Francis Stein. Anyway. <clears throat> okay. The, your race can't keep you down when you are using the unseen in the scale of life. I've watched it happen. I've watched people who lived in the projects come out because they took the Word of God and did not let the circumstances they had been dealt in life, a school system that failed them. I'll never forget, uh, bless her heart, the girl, the girl could not write properly. She wrote phonetically. She would write letters to us and stuff, and they were phonetic. They weren't, you know. Um, the phone was F-O-N. It wasn't P-H-O-N-E. I mean, it was literally, we went, to, went and, and Janie was going to help, so we went together. Janie helped create a budget for her. Took all the money she, was, you know, she had, had, what she was getting, what she was earning, what she was getting. Uh, she was disabled. She had a horrible heart condition. And, um, you know, children, she was getting money. And she was able to take that budget and budget her. She was able to move out of the projects, move into her own, her own uh, mobile home. It was still a home. It was new. I mean, it changed everything. Amen? She was taking the Word of God, acting the Word of God. Watch the change. Watch her go from the hopelessness of living in, the, in those, that, that revolving door of staying where you are. Groundhog Day, one generation after the other. One generation after the other. But I was going to say, the school system failed her so bad. She graduated, had a diploma from Guilford County Schools, couldn't read or write. There's a system designed to defeat you. But there is another system in place that will liberate you. That will bring you up and bring you out. And establish your coming and your going. And that, this, is where I'm, this is where we kind of move from the abstract to the living it for real stuff. It can change you so that even a system that is designed, that had slavery, that had people who fought even after the end of slavery with amendments to their state constitutions that still wouldn't allow uh, blacks to vote. 
had all kinds of constrictions on, on them being able to vote and that kind of stuff, which is why we ended up with the 13th, 14th, is it 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Because they, they would come up with laws, they passed an amendment, they come up with more laws, passed another amendment, and finally on the 15th, they got it where they, just, they couldn't come up with a way around it. They took, the, they took three amendments to the Constitution to fix it so the states couldn't fix it so they, couldn't, they didn't have to listen to it. Okay? And make it so that they, they could vote. Black, you know, African Americans could vote. Blacks could vote. Um, and evil system. And then Reconstruction. And then, you know, the, 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 the problems of the South and the, you know, uh, after, after Reconstruction, post-Reconstruction, and all the, the, st and the hatred and the anger. And, um, you know, the, the anger of white people. The whites-only water fountains. The whites-only cafes. The whites-only barbershops. Coloreds only. I, I, I I can never forget. I will never forget. In 1969, we were moving to Aden, North Carolina from Greenville. And we, we were riding through the streets of Aden. And I had never seen anything like this in my life. And on the, and, and those buildings. And we went by a thing and it had a city cafe. And it had two entrances. And one said whites only. The other said coloreds only. And then turned the corner and went by the city barbershop. Whites only, coloreds only. I'd never seen anything like that. You, can you imagine the impression I made on an 11-year-old? Have never seen anything like that in your life, and you saw that for the first time, and going thinking, "What in the world?" Okay. See, that was still embedded in people. The race riots in Aden in 1972. I mean, our high school was bombed. The uh, the, the uh, sports shot was bombed twice with dynamite. Um, marching in the street, cutting chickens' heads off, and walking around letting blood drop out right outside of our school. <clears throat> I mean, we we had all kinds of stuff going on. The impression you have on your life. Some of, my, some of the best people I know from high school are, are African American. Okay? Good people. Doesn't mean that we're better than them, they're less than us. You know, if you're white, us, they're, less, they're not, I'm not better than anybody. They're not lesser than me. Amen? But a culture. Did create. I mean, this is 1969, and there's still white only color, the only cafe and diner and uh, barbershop. It's not there. They're not there. The buildings are still there, but that's not there. It's been gone for a long, 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 long time. Been gone since about 70. I think 70 or 71 that finally got. But you know, that's still too long. That was that's almost 100 years of post Reconstruction. And it was still going on. No, I know it was evil. We, and, and my high school was merged, and, and, and we had Aiden and Grifton, North Carolina. Grifton's 15 miles away. And we three, had three. We had Grifton High School, South Aiden High School, and Aiden High School. And they merged into a, a, a desegregated, unified high school for, the, for all three of those. It became Aiden and Grifton. And, uh, of course, South Aiden's been torn down. They have a memorial sign out there. It was there from 1931 to 1971. It was, it was, a, it was South Aiden High School. It wasn't torn down right away, but, it, it, but that's when it stopped being a high school. When, the, when that happened. And, um, you know, if you ate at Bums, you're heading back out the highway left, you turn left, it was just about three quarters of a mile down the right is where that was. And it was only, listen, it was only three, three, four blocks away from Aiden High School. It was a five minute walk between the two. Okay? Um, but, yeah, that stuff went on. And you're going to find racist people today, they're there. They won't like it that you walk in and get a job where you where they work. Or now they put it on the other side, and you don't if if you are uh, African American and you get a position over white people and you got hatred in your heart, and it goes on with and it's, it's it's get back time and it's payback time. All right, what's working in you? Death. Death. Jesus lived in, a, lived in a day of slavery. Entire nation was held captive by the Roman Empire. Paul dealt with slavery. And what did he tell them? Serve your masters as the Lord, not what I serve as men pleasers. Service, you know, you know, treat them as brothers. I mean, masters treat them as us brothers. Even in the midst of an institutionalized situation, he still commanded them to walk in the love of God. Why? Because we want to change this. But we're not going to change it in the flesh. 
We're going to change it here. Now, that, I'm just using this as an example of, of a real-life circumstance. Okay? Not, not, you know, just maybe segueing back into my teaching on love here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen? And it's after 8 o'clock, isn't it? I got one thing to say. I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up for the 9 o'clock hour. No, I can't do that. They won't let me. Okay, Jesse just sent me something. 40.3 million people are in slavery globally today. Most of them women and children. And 71% of the women were girl or girls were forced into sex. 40 million people today. So there's evil in the world. There are circumstances in the world that, that are working against us. You know, a lot of times when we're talking along these lines, we're thinking about, you know, our car, our job. We're talking about our money, our bank account, our bodies. And, and we forget that this thing, these things don't apply just to you getting blessings on your health and your prosperity. These things are how you live your daily life. Does the Word of God bear more weight on you than the things you can see, the things that are going on, the, the circumstances that are going on around you? we will share one more story. We're going we're to close here. And that we have to because we're late. A few years ago, um, I, I, I um, eight, ten, about ten years ago, I went. I, uh, there was this, and she still works there. There's this lady that worked at uh, Sam's. And um, now listen, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if somebody doesn't like you because because you're you're a different color. I've encountered black people not liking me because I'm white. Yeah. Can, can you believe that? <laughs> Isn't that something, Jeff, is as likable as I am? <laughs> and this woman, I, I, I'm saying she would check you out. You know, she, she you marked your ticket as you walked out the door and stuff. And she was just the honoriest. I mean, I, I, could tell, I can tell you. She could be talking to an African-American person in front of me and one behind me, and when I came through, it was like I had the bubonic plague. I was super contagious. I was walking death. Just would. Just, I mean, just it instantly change and then change back. And I thought, that's it. And here's what most of us go. I'm going to the manager. I'm taking care of this. I said, I'm going to win her over. I'm going to win her over. And so I'd come in. I'd smile. I'd say, hey, to but she had a grandbaby, and she started wearing the picture button, you know, the things you, you slap, but they had the picture printed on. That's your grandbaby? Yes! <laughs> I had her. I had her. Because every time I'd go in there, I'd ask, how's that grandbaby doing? And she'd get to talk. I don't get that other stuff anymore. All right? I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this woman, and she's going to like me, okay? I'm going to win her heart over. I just, and, I, and look, there's a side of you wants to rise up and say, who do you think you are? You know? You know, all you're going to get is a fight. You know? That's not what I'm there for. I wanted to, I wanted to win her over. I can get her to talk and smile and laugh and everything now. And she might not do it to the next honky that comes up, but she does it to me. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's their responsibility to fix it, to win her. We, we can change them one at a time, one circumstance at a time, one person at a time. We can change the world. So these things aren't only about you getting a new car, getting a new house, or getting your body healed. These are your walk in the world Carrying Jesus, carrying the light, being the light, and changing circumstances around you so they're no longer the same. Because you've encountered the not seen against the seen, and the seen had to change. Amen. Praise God. Let's see, receive our offering. Go ahead and put that out there if you haven't already. We're going to receive our offering right now in Jesus' name. You need, uh, need an envelope. Brother Joe's right there. 
You, if you're giving electronically, you can ring her up, PayPal or Square Cash. And we're going to pray real quick so we can, get, we can shut down and get out of here. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless the people that are tithing and giving right now. We call heaven's windows open and the blessings of God overtaking them now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And if you're going to pull a Medea, you can say, A to the men or hallelujah. <coughs> All right. So praise the Lord. Um, for the, those who are late, you didn't get to hear it. Janie has transferred. To